Constantine is an interesting one, really. You see, it was argued by his um, uh, pagan uh, associates, <laughs> if you like, the Solar Invictus side of his um, uh, spirituality, um, that, well, Rome decayed when it became Christian. And of course, he divided it, didn't he? Not only was really, well, I say of course, and it's pure historicity, I don't know how much fact it is, but he not only was really running two gods at once, Solar Invictus on one side the coin, picture of himself, and on the other side this uh, cross that he saw in the sky, in the clouds, I suppose, um, where he vowed to be faithful to the Christian God if God gave him the, the victory at the Battle of Milvan Bridge, which God did <laughs> in the story. <laughs> and, uh, well, we do know he was emperor, finally. Well, he was double in another way, too. I mean, he shifted the capital from Rome to Constantinople. Constantine, you see, Constan, Constantine, Constantinople, city of Constantine, uh, and uh, the Bosphorus. Well, I mean, that was a heady thing to do, to shift the capital. Hazardous, and uh, extremely hazardous. We see down the line that um, the Roman Empire was split in two, east and west. And because they were not uh, in full unity, um, Rome had become extremely weak, and the barbarians uh, from Asia poured down upon them, of course. Hmm. So, really, I should say that a better actual example of... Um, one God, monotheism, would have been um, Akhenaten of ancient Egypt. I, I don't know, is it something like, I think it's 1300 and something, isn't it? Somewhere around then. BC. And um, he abolished all the existing religion and uh, well, set himself up as... Um, the one voice for God, and and that was the sun god. I think it was Ra, wasn't it? Uh, and Akhenaten, the pharaoh, was um, his one mouthpiece. So who's a better example of unifying? But interestingly, again, um, the empire, Egyptian empire in this case, he wasn't terribly interested in protecting uh, the fringe of it. And um, there's all sorts of re historical reports to him that, uh, um, well, they need more help from Pharaoh to protect these outlying uh, countries, writing in, so to speak. So, um, mm, you could say in that case, Christianity, in the case of Constantine, and um, Akhenaten's God, uh, Ra. Well, wasn't received too well, and was a bit antithetical. Is it uh, antithetical? Is that the word? But a bit um, troublesome as regards worldly success. And indeed, if the religion you're turning to is truly spiritual. 
which is going to be putting heaven and life eternal first, not the material transitory world we're in. Yeah. Mm. Well, this isn't so surprising, is it? The whole point is that if you're not, if you if you're worshiping the things of this world, where you get some material success, and you then find out that the material success is not anything like as gratifying and, and satisfactory as you had hoped, you start to get disillusioned, which is precisely what we want to be more godly. This is life eternal to know thee. What's of value and so forth. So it's right for the individual doing it. Um, and it's true its consequences are not some great worldly success. In other words, things are a heavenly success, which is what matters to you in the end. not an eternal worldly success. So, strangely, the outcome of switching to, um, if you like, the one true God, as you understand it, should be precisely that, um, from a worldly point of view, you're seen as a dismal failure. I mean, possibly, that's a bit emotive to say that, but possibly and perhaps even probably. But from your own spiritual and godly point of view, heavenly point of view, quite simply you've done the right thing. You've got rid of your delusion and you're fixed on something that constitutes life eternal, as you understand it. Now, I don't mean either of these two instances are perfect examples, but, um, well, simply makes an interesting meditation, so to speak, doesn't it? Illustration of, parable of what we mean. Hmm. Thank you, Heavenly Dad. Well, the Hebrew view of um, religion had it that um, if you lived a, what we would call ethical life, you would end up uh, prosperous and uh, powerful enough to, um, to do well. As uh, in some sense Abraham in the story achieves with um, the power of God within. But of course the view of God was, um, well, in many ways anything but the Jesus view of God, accepting that God had a, um, a, a helpful, protective attitude to Abraham, of course because of his devotion to him. But the Hebrew view in general is, is an obedience relationship. When we get as far as the Jesus story, it's a love-devotion relationship. You could say the earlier or the more primitive view is um, You worship God and you obey him in fear. And the more Jesus view is, it's a relationship of love between you both ways. And you're devoted to him. Mm. In both cases we have this aspect of monotheism on God, but, well, the biblical account shows that the actual nation, the people, were continually um, still relating to other gods, much to the um, 
concern of the prophets as preserved in the scripture. Well, the eternal anything is not of the things of this world which are transitory. And so the value of eternal life and so on must be in terms of the non-material and uh, one would expect that to prioritize such would not result in um, the Christian prosperity doctrine, <laughs> um, which even Christianity found extremely suspect, of course. We seek a, a different kingdom. Our kingdom is not of this world. Love you, Dad. Thank you, Dad.